Morning, MF. Nice to be back, back in the field again. Um, so the title of the talk pretty much says it all. We're going to cover time zones and daylight saving time. We cover a couple of other things first. Railway time, which is basically leads up to time zones. Um, and we're going to solve the problem at the end of why your phone knows that it's daylight saving time, even if you don't. So um, we'll kick off in Britain. Um, at the tail end of the sort of industrial revolution, there's kind of two important networks that come out um, that affect timekeeping. So the first is the rail network in about the 1830s, and then the, the electric telegraph in the 1840s. Okay. Ah. Anyone? Uh, the USB is the HDMI is in. Okay. I'll, I'll rewind. So, right, you can now see what the talk's about. Yeah, <laughs> time zones and daylight saving time. Um, so, yeah, like I said at the beginning, there's, we're going to cover railway time because it kind of leads up into the time zone system. So, it's probably worth covering that first. And then at the end, we'll um, we'll answer the question of the phone and how your phone knows um, when it's DST and not. So, railway time. Um, two important networks coming out of the late industrial revolution. The, rail network and the telegraph, and they both have an impact on um, the history of timekeeping. This is the first intercity railway. This is um, the Liverpool to Manchester railway in 1830, going at an ungodly speed of 30 miles an hour. Um, within about 20 years, uh, the network grows, we get um, top speeds of 78 miles an hour, um, and, and quite a you know, broad network, pretty much everywhere is connected. And there's some standardization that comes around around timekeeping. So um, to kind of explain, there's a lot of spiders here, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, to kind of explain why the timekeeping issue arises, is we're going to take an imaginary journey. So let's say you get on um, in London, uh, London Paddington. You've got your stovepipe hat on and your copy of the Times under your arm. Um, you're traveling to Bristol Temple Meads. You're going westwards, and it's going to be about a four-hour journey. Um, you've got incredible sight lines. You can see Ben, uh, Big Ben, somehow from Paddington. Um, and you check, and it's one o'clock in London. It's one o'clock on your pocket watch. You travel for four hours. On your pocket watch, it's five o'clock. But when you arrive in Bristol, the clocks all say something different. They say 4 or 49. See, so somehow you've gained 11 minutes. Um, why? Why is that? Um, so the to answer that question, you sort of have to realize that at this point in time, there is no sort of time standardization, really. So in London, it's, let's say you're in Greenwich Park in London, and you, you see the sun in the sky, and you track as it goes overhead, and at the highest point in the sky, that is noon in London. You do the same in Bristol, so when it goes overhead, that's noon in Bristol. Those are not simultaneous events. Um, they happen about 11 minutes apart, because the Earth is rotating. So local time, in Bristol is not the same as local time in London. They are off by a little bit. So that's a problem if you're trying to make railroad scheduling or railroad timetables. So um, a bit of a trauma warning for this next slide. If you work in graphic design or user experience, you might want to look away now. Um, <laughs> this is railway timetables in the 1840s. Uh, and obviously timetables are hard anyway, but if, when you get everything running on local time, it's just way more complicated. So what came about was a sort of standardization or a move towards a standard time. Um, and GMT was the obvious one. I mean, Greenwich Observatory had been around a couple of hundred years at this point, and all of the maps and you know, some sea charts and whatever were all using GMT. Um, so it made sense to move on to GMT. So uh, Great Western were the first to do it. Um, and it sort of became standardized in 1847, and it took a while for it to sort of roll out to the rest of the UK. Um, but yeah, by 1855, pretty much all the towns and cities had moved across. Um, it wasn't universally, nobody was universally happy about it. Obviously London was, because you, you, know, you don't have to change your clocks or anything. Um, but Bristol was, the one, uh, was one of the ones that wasn't terribly happy about it. This is the Bristol Exchange clock installed in 1822. The hands on the, let's see where this can go, on the left hand side, there's two, two red hands. Those show the hour and the minute in Bristol local time. But that extra hand on the other side was added later, and that actually shows GMT. So that's not actually a second hand, that's another minute hand. So you can imagine sort of 
Bristol here, then locked 11 minutes apart as it kind of moved around like that. So that, that clock's still there. I checked it on um, Street View before I came in, so you can still go and see it. I, I want to go see it. Um, but yeah, even Bristol came on board eventually in um, 1852. So. so imagine the same problem, railroad scheduling, timetables, and so on, um, in America, much bigger area. So you've got um, a much sort of larger, uh, more developed railroad network as well. Um, in 1853, shortly after Britain's standardized on GMT, there was a particularly nasty railroad accident on the Providence and Worcester line um, railroad. Um, many people died, and it was basically attributed to bad scheduling. Um, so this is the railway network a little bit further on in the 1870s, and you can see it stretches all the way across the USA, so there's quite, um, quite a lot of work to be done. If you uh, want to take a journey from New York across to San Francisco, looking at that, um, you're probably going to have to jump a few, few lines. And the way that the networks worked in America was all of the train railroad timetables ran on whatever the corporate headquarters was for the railroad. So New York Central Railroad ran New York time. So if you're trying to make a connection, you can imagine you're sitting in somewhere in the middle and you've got to work out what local time is in New York and then convert that in your head and then you've got a connection to make, so you've got to connect to something else. And there's all sorts of things done to try and make this easy, but it's, it's not an easy problem to solve. So standardization was one way to try and simplify this problem. Um, America's bigger, you know, so a time zone system was the, the, sort of the way that they approached it. They looked at the GMT and then essentially applied it into five zones across um, the US. Notice the, uh, so the, the, those are the circles at the top, that's degrees of longitude. So um, I don't know if we've got anybody, any small children, but I'm gonna kind of cover latitude and longitude very quickly so that everyone sort of knows what it is. It's a way of pinpointing a point on the globe. Um, latitude lines go around the globe. Um, big fat one in the middle, much like myself, um, is the equator. And then you have lines of longitude that run pole to pole, and we define one of those as being the prime meridian. So the, that becomes zero, and everything else gets a number every 15 degrees around the Earth. Um, having a prime meridian gives you a weird side effect called the international dateline, which we'll look at in, in a bit as well. So, right. So this is the time zone system. If I can get the spiders out of the way. Um, 1883. We've got Britain on GMT. Uh, you've got America with its sort of five zone system, also using. Um, Greenwich as uh, the prime meridian because of the way that came about. Um, 1884 rolls around and the idea is to take this system and roll it out to the entire world. So there is a conference to do that. Um, the International Meridian Conference meets in Washington DC. Yeah. <laughs> There's some fabulous moustaches and beards going on in this workshop. Yeah. Um, 41 delegates from 26 countries, including such stars as the Ottoman Empire, um, and Hawaii, which was actually an independent nation at that point. So, so here's what they debated. Um, there's lots of things on here, but Resolution 2 was the principal one. That's the one that says we are going to make Greenwich, or GMT, the prime meridian of the world. Um, here's what it went down. 22 nations voted for it. Uh, the Dominican Republic voted against it. I've actually got, I haven't got to the bottom of why that was. I would like to know. Um, Brazil and France abstained. So why Greenwich? Um, these were all possible meridians in 1884. Um, every sort of major power in Europe had an observatory, and every observatory made observations, and therefore they had a meridian of their own. You know, France would have had the Paris Observatory, uh, you know, Copenhagen for Denmark, etc., etc. So the, all of these were possible. So why particularly Greenwich? Um, well, it ended up, it's kind of boring answer really, but it's pragmatism. Um, the US and British systems were already using it, um, so no, there's no need to make any changes. But the kind of killer blow really was that uh, Britain was kind of at the height of its sort of sea power at this point, um, and British naval charts had Greenwich on them, so you didn't have to print a whole bunch of new charts, you basically just kept the old ones, um, and Greenwich was accepted. So, right, we'll do a couple of things about the Prime Meridian. If you get a chance, um, I really do recommend going to the Royal Greenwich Observatory. It's in Greenwich Park, it's beautiful. It's got lots of fun stuff going on inside. It's got um, Harrison sea clocks and H4 and things like that. So, um, but if you go there, you will probably get your photograph taken on this line because it's one of the things that you can do there. That, there is a sort of group of people, hopefully you can see it in the photograph. So there's a group of people on there and they're crowded on the line and you get a photograph and that's you on the, on the prime meridian. 
Um, it's worth pointing out, the Prime Meridian is a mag magical invisible line and it goes through all sorts of places. So you could probably get your photograph much quicker in a pizza hut in Mali or something. You know, there's, and, <laughs> there's plenty of places on that line, but the people, everyone likes to go and get it done out there. So I've kind of drawn the line on so it's a little bit clearer. So the line in red, is that's the line as it sort of runs in and you'll see it kind of goes in through a door and then it's dotted it all the way through. Um, this is what the back looks like. Uh, my beautiful assistant here is demonstrating. It goes into a door and you can see there's lots of flaps and stuff a bit further up. And at the back, you've got the same sort of thing. So the reason for that is that inside, it all opens up um, and you have what's called the airy transit instrument in there, which is essentially a telescope that's on a sort of cog, if you like. So it's, it's, it only moves in one direction. But um, what it does is it tracks a uh, star in the sky and it, as it transits across um, the, the sky. So that's, uh, that particular instrument was designed by George Bidleri, who was the Astronomer Royal at the time. Um, and because the Prime Meridian was defined as being Greenwich, this was, uh, it was essentially the Airy Meridian, specifically his Meridian, um, that became the Prime Meridian. Um, fun fact, it's not his only one. There's one on Mars. Um, it runs through the airy crater. As you can see it just there on the right-hand side. Um, so yeah, he has two prime meridians, which is like mad skills. <laughs> yeah. OK, if you walk around Greenwich, you'll notice plaques on the wall. So there are other meridians. This is the point of making that airy was the, specifically the prime meridian. Um, John Flamsteed, who was the original first astronomer royal, um, he gets one as well. When they built the Royal Greenwich Observatory, it was, um, they spent a lot of money on it, but they didn't actually spend any money on equipment. He had to buy his own. So when he got his act together and got some kit, then he put it in that point, and that became his Meridian. Um, the second one is the uh, Edmund Halley, the second astronomer royal. So you'll see these kind of dotted around if you're up there. The other fun fact as well, I mean, I probably this crowd might know this one, but the Prime Meridian is not the same as the GPS Meridian. Its official name is the International Earth Rotation and Reference Service Meridian, Reference Meridian. <laughs> but call it, let's go ahead and call it GPS for now. But they're, they're quite different, quite far apart. Um, there's a bin that marks it, so you can actually find it if, you, if you're looking for it. <laughs> but it's not really a, Or you can take your GPS receiver and then you will find it. Um, the reason for this uh, is a little complicated, but essentially models of the Earth in 1800, models of the Earth in 1960s, whenever GPS was being developed, are, have, have improved. So that's the short answer. There is a paper on it if you're interested and you go into the, all, the, all the details. Um, the Royal Greenwich Observatory is not the only Royal Observatory in London. Um, I only found this out a few years back, but there's an observatory in Kew called the King's Observatory, um, built for George III. Beautiful building, looks really good. Uh, it's in a golf course, apparently, but um, I would like to get there at some point. And of course, it had its own equipment, so it gets a meridian, so a few meridians in London. Right, we're gonna cover time zones in theory. I'll do practice in a second, but this is how it's supposed to work. Here's the Earth. We divide it 15 degrees of longitude um, with a prime meridian in Greenwich, um, which gives you an international date line in the Pacific. Okay. How this works in practice is any territory that is in, one, in, in, a, in a zone can be in the zone or it can decide to be somewhere else. Um, and that happens a lot. So actually, no, I'll give you the width of the zone. So the zones are 15 degrees apart as well, but the, the line down the middle, and it's seven and a half degrees either side. So it's, they span 15 degrees from the center of that point. So if I take the lines away, it's probably a little easier to see. Right, in practice, it gets a little messier because, you know, it's the real world and there's country boundaries and all sorts of stuff going on. Um, not everything runs on one hour time zones either. There's quite a lot of half hour time zones um, dotted about. Uh, and in fact, there's a couple of, what, three 45 minute ones. <coughs> Nepal being the most um, sort of well-known example. Uh, the time, the, the thing to kind of know about, this is such a messy thing. The international date line is a phenomenon caused by having the prime meridian. There is no standards for this at all. It's just a side effect of having the prime meridian. So there's a lot of leeway in terms of if, let's say, you're uh, piling a ship across uh, the dateline, it's entirely up to you, really, when you set your clocks and how you, how you shift across. Um, any lines that you see are guidance, really. So this way, you, you get quite a lot of um, difference when you sort of 
see how Google have it and how, how you know, other maps and, and draw it because there really is no standard for it at all. And of course, peop some uh, islands have jumped across the date line, so you've got this notion of the, the line islands in Kiribati, which are plus 14 hours, which means at any point in time you could have three days on the go at once. You could have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, same moment in time having three essential local um, values. Yeah, super messy. It's probably a, like a whole talk on that. But um, other things too, China really should be three time zones um, when you look at where it's covering, but it all runs on Beijing time. Um, and Antarctica, I, this is the one I kind of wanted to get at the bottom of. I was, when I kind of pitched the talk, I didn't know the answer to this. So to me, it seems obvious that if you're at the poles, the whole system falls apart, right? You, you can run around and be in all the time zones. You can jump across and, you know. How does that work? How does it actually work practically in, in Antarctica? So what you've got here is all of the uh, Antarctic research stations. Um, and the kind of dull answer when I got to the bottom of it is that they more or less follow whatever their host country is. You know, so the, the, the British um, would follow UK time. They would also observe daylight saving time, even though they really don't need to in Antarctica. Um, <laughs> but it keeps you in, in sync with um, your host country. Uh, and sometimes they uh, hold the sort of same time as their whether being served from like a supply station or something like New Zealand perhaps they might keep New Zealand time because that makes more sense so just practicality is what they're going with and um, this other thing turned up when I was digging through it which amused me as well like not only have you got you know six months of daylight and six months of night time and keeping wacky clocks to whatever your host nation or the clocks don't actually work very well um, they seem to go a bit fast so yeah, I can't imagine what, it, there's probably a good thriller in that, like things going wrong and when things actually happen or something. All right, something sensible, let's do daylight saving time. I think the way to understand daylight saving time, actually the way to come at it is to look at daylight patterns across the earth. Um, that's a kind of useful way in. So we'll look at the extremes, we'll look at equator. So the equator, you've pretty much got 12 hours of night time, 12 hours of daytime. There's not really a lot of variation. Um, so you could move it, I mean, you could apply DST and just you know, move everything by an hour, but why would you? You know, it's, it's probably inconvenient just to move your clocks for no reason. And um, the poles are more extreme. Like I said before about Antarctica, you know, you've got 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of, that's right, no, you have six months of, of daylight, six months of, of nighttime, or, you know, a month of twilight in between. So you can move the clocks as much as you like, but it's really not gonna make any difference whatsoever. You get more of the same just by moving it, so. Um, so where you actually get daylight saving time is, in these sort of uh, temperate bands, if you like, so sort of Europe um, or Australia, perhaps, you know, um, anywhere where there's variation over the course of the course of the year, um, and the purpose of it really is to try and extend the amount of natural light you are getting in the evening, um, in the summer, because obviously you don't get as much. In the, um, I'm talking about the northern hemisphere here, but you know, let's say you live in Greenwich, you get up at six o'clock in the morning. Um, in the winter, you can see from here that you're actually getting up in the dark, like we've all kind of experienced this. And anything below that line is stuff you're sleeping through, right? So there's a lot of natural light there that you're gonna sleep through in the summer. So the point of, that, of daylight saving time is to kind of extend that by shifting the clocks. So that's what it looks like when you shift the clocks. Everything moves up and you get an extra hour of daylight in the evening. So that's the purpose of it. Um, it's usually attributed to Ben Franklin. Uh, really not, no, he, I mean, he was, he wrote a humorous essay in which he suggests, um, he makes calculations for how much candle wax you could save in Paris. Um, he suggests firing cannons to wake people up. Um, so he's kind of playing with the idea of getting people up early, um, but there's no notion of putting clocks forward and back or anything like that yet. Um, this is the first series proposal. Um, George Hudson, he was from London, he moved to New Zealand, and he was a keen entomologist, so he wanted some time to, to look for insects, basically. Yeah, he wanted a couple more hours in the evening. He pitched it to the Wellington Philosophical Society. <coughs> they were actually quite um, receptive, they were quite keen, um, but in the end it, it, it didn't really happen. So this was picked up in 1907 by William Willett. Uh, he was a successful London builder, and his, so his, the buildings and houses that he made were famous for their kind of use of natural daylight. So this was kind of on his mind. <coughs> Fun fact, he is also Chris Martin's great, great, great granddad, I think as well, but I don't know what you would do with that information, but there you go. Um, he produced this pamphlet called The Waste of Daylight. Um, 
Here's what he was suggesting it would be good, why you might want to do it. And essentially, it was about energy. You know, you can save a lot of energy if you don't have to run uh, lighting in the evening. So um, He got quite a lot of support. I mean, he pushed this his entire life. Um, Winston Churchill gave speeches on his behalf, saying, you know, the, extolling the virtues of daylight saving time. Um, but the first known example of it actually being employed um, comes from Canada. Uh, this is Thunder Bay in Canada, or called Thunder Bay now. It was Fort William back then. Um, and Fort William and a, another neighboring town um, adopted daylight saving time. So it's in the records there. There may well be others, but that's the, that's the only one we know of at the moment. Um, the first country to use it is actually um, Germany in World War II. Um, they were, again, they were using it to try and save coal, save energy. Um, and the Allies jumped on board pretty soon afterwards. Um, a lot of Europe adopted it as well. So um, During wartime, Britain was on double summer time, so we were effectively on European time. You know, we kind of shifted. If the Europeans were in summer time, then we've jumped to, and we were, were on the same, which makes sense if you're trying to coordinate a war. The last thing you want to be is trying to get an off by one error, you know, in your, in your clocks. So. Um, and 2016, I, I don't want to say celebrated, marked, shall we say, the ex uh, 100 years of daylight saving time. Um, there's a good exhibition at the Royal Observatory, um, worth a visit if you, at the time. So I'm going to look quickly now at DST patterns throughout the world, because one of the things is it's within territories, it, not everybody, not every part of the territory wants to. Something, something like Australia, like in the north, they observe it, but in the south, they don't. Um, Canada, in the Yukon, they, they don't. In Saskatchewan, they don't, but other places do. Um, my favorite is America. America is really unusual. Hawaii doesn't, um, and bits of Arizona don't. <laughs> so <laughs> what you've got here is you can see the red parts. The Arizona officially do not observe daylight saving time, but you'll notice there's a kind of patch there. I've got it in blue. I'm hoping that comes up and you can see it. That blue area is the Navajo Indian Reservation, and it stretches out into Utah and New Mexico. And Utah and New Mexico observe daylight saving time, so the Navajo Indian Reservation also observes it, even though it's in Arizona. However, there's a little red spot in the middle there. That's the Hopi Indian Reservation. Um, it being entirely within Arizona, it does not observe daylight saving time. Yeah. So we have DST news, this was weird, like I pitched this in January, February, and then March comes around and USA votes to put daylight saving time, permanent daylight saving time, um, in 2023. Well, it has passed the Senate, it hasn't passed the House, so who knows. They've also gone down this road before and reverted it in the 70s, so um, I don't know if it'll happen, we'll see. Europe's also kind of in the same boat. Europe voted in 2018 to stop observing DST. Britain, being part of Europe at that time, was also with this, but um, there's just been a lot going on, and they haven't had a chance to, to do it. So both the EU and UK observed it this year, but I suspect at some point in the future they'll get around to um, making that happen. I can't really leave it without trying to cover the pros and cons. This is kind of a modern take on it. Basically, it's good for the economy. You know, with an extra hour at night, people go to bars, people go traveling. Um, it boosts the economy by, by, by a decent number, which is the, the kind of main purpose for doing it. Um, cons, really, you're giving yourself jet lag. It's just horrible. You know, you're putting yourself forward an hour, and there's all sorts of heart attacks and accidents that go up as a result of the shift from one to another. So, okay, to answer the question of computers, somewhere I'm sure you've all got a phone in your pocket or something like that. So, there's a decent chance you're running Android or iOS, or this being AMF, you wrote your own. Who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> But if it's anywhere sort of Unix or Linux based, there's a pretty good chance it has a copy of the time zone database within it. Um, time zone database has many names. It's been around since the 80s, uh, so 86 I think it started. So this is what it is. It is a database that contains, this is from their FAQ, so I can get it right. It contains code and data that represent the history of local time for many representative locations around the globe. I think I skirt around the language there. It's updated periodically to reflect all of the things I've just talked about. So UTC offsets, daylight saving time, blah, blah, blah. Um, the most surprising thing, if you've not come across it, is it's, uh, it's an open source project. Um, and it's run entirely by volunteers, like EMF. Like this, this is an entirely volunteer-driven project. But it's fundamental to the internet. Like, you know, if this thing wasn't there, 
um, you'd have to set your own phone. It'd be disastrous, right? Yeah. Um, there was a talk earlier this year from Paul Eggert, who is the current maintainer, um, and he goes into a lot of the history on this. So if you're interested in the history specifically of this, I recommend that talk. I will link to it and tweet it later on if you're, if you're up for it. Um, here's how the process works. So there's a mailing list. And if you're at all interested in time zones, then you can join the mailing list. Anyone can join the mailing list. Um, here's an example of an email that came in in March, and it's from the Palestine Ministry of Telecom and Information Technology, saying, here are the DST rules for Palestine for this year. Um, that gets turned into an entry in the database, which looks a bit like this. And this was turned around in like a week. You know, it was done very, very fast. Um, and then the, what happens is the upstream um, you know, if you're on Debian or Boot or whatever, you know, that, that, they bring that version in and then it's rolled out to all the other operating systems. Here's kind of how it looks up close. Um, the rule at the bottom is human readable. You have to trust me. I think most techies would read that. But the thing about it is that gets compiled for all the various systems as well. Um, the most interesting thing, I think, is all of the comments. There's some fantastic um, sort of notes on the history of time zones and daylight saving and all sorts of you know, politics behind it. Um, it's on GitHub, you can look it up. It's, it's well worth a couple of hours of your time. Um, and to finish, this is, <laughs> you've all seen this. This, is, this feels right to me about the time zone database. Um, there are some threats to it. Uh, it was sued in 2011. Um, there was a, some heated discussion on the, on the mailing list last year. Um, but it is fundamental to the internet, and we cannot afford to lose it. So I know I'd like to thank by thanking the maintainers of the TZ database, frankly, because you know my phone works. Um, so with that, I am out of time.